the humpbacks have returned to the shores of Western Greenland. They've bounced back from near extinction thanks to an international effort to stop their slaughter. And here they are, feeding at the edge of Greenland's largest glacier. The Jakobshavn glacier stretches inland for around 40 miles, but for how long? The melt here in Greenland hit record levels in the summer. Its ice cap, which holds around 8% of the world's fresh water, just lost 12.5 billion tons of ice in a single day. It raised sea levels globally. That melt on August the 2nd was the largest single day loss in recorded history. The entire ice sheet which covers Greenland contains enough to raise sea levels across the globe 20 feet if it melted. Climate models say that won't happen for a while, but consider this. The summer's level of ice melt wasn't supposed to happen for another 50 years. Greenland is now losing so much ice that it is shaping the world in such a way you cannot ignore it anymore. Just a trend, William. The world naturally warms up, yeah. doesn't matter. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Greenland is losing approximately 8,500 metric tons of ice per second, day in, day out, uh, around the clock. Per second? Per second. 8,500 tons of ice per second. Mind-blowing. Like, it's hard to, that's why it's, that, that's why it's a concern. In fact, over half the Arctic's permanent ice has melted, revealing a landscape that has been hidden for 40,000 years. It's only when you can finally scramble onto the glaciers, and that isn't easy, and you're lost in the immensity of this. Up the glacier, an area of ice shelf 10 times the size of the UK, pouring billions of tons of water into the Atlantic Ocean every day, every year. And with every day and every year that passes, the rate of that increase is gaining momentum in forces that may, unless we act soon, be unstoppable. Disappearing sea ice means shipping routes like the Northwest Passage are opening up. That could cut freight miles, but others say these waters should be protected as a World Heritage Site. We're expecting more traffic from uh, mineral industry, oil industry, tourism, and uh, more traffic in the Northwest Passage. But, but ships are safe now, and they, you, you know, they're, they're reasonably green, they don't throw their waste overboard. The fact that you can open something up to shipping doesn't necessarily mean the area's going to be destroyed, does it? Right here, in this pristine area, you can use heavy fuel oil. One shipwreck with heavy fuel oil in this area could be a catastrophe of enormous dim dimensions. Moments later, as if on cue, we suddenly have company. Diesel-powered company. Good afternoon, everybody. You weren't expecting British television, were you? <laughs> so we hope that our local contact is here because we usually just arrive and then he comes and then we talk about how we can make this a wonderful afternoon for our guests. Problem is, these Arctic waters are some of the most fragile marine environments on the planet and there's no control about the numbers of luxury cruise ships driving through it. In 17 degrees summer heat, t-shirt weather, it's hot work performing in sealskin jackets and polar bear trousers, traditions of the past played out for tourists. But the old way of life is disappearing, partly due to climate change. Rainfall, unusual in the high Arctic, is triggering landslides. This village is entirely built on permafrost, 
but its foundations are melting in the summer. Now over half the town will need to be demolished and rebuilt. 75-year-old Joseph Manumina, a village elder in Sirapolok, he's seen the glaciers melt at a rapid rate. We can sail now. That's a, that's also a benefit for us because we can travel mm. further and faster by boat. Yeah. But when it's getting dark yeah. in the early winter, like if we say when the sun co comes down, like in October and November, that's where the, it's dark. Then we cannot go up by boat because we cannot see anything. And the sea ice will be too thin to go out by dog sled. That's where the problem is. So the dog population reduces year on year. Without sea ice, you can't use sled dogs. They're shot. Tourism is developing a new economy here, whale watching. Though some Inuit are still allowed to hunt a small quota of whales, many more find there's better money from whale watching rather than harpooning. But the tourists are also coming for the Arctic surroundings. And as Greenland melts four times faster than previously predicted, the futures, both of the humpbacks and we humans around the world, are in jeopardy. Alex Thompson, Channel 4 News, Western Greenland. And tomorrow we have an exclusive report from Alex Thompson on how Greenland is polluting itself. It's entitled Denmark's Dirty Secret. Well, earlier I spoke to journalist and author of The Uninhabitable Earth, David Wallace-Wells. I began by asking him if he thinks that democratic governments are able to introduce and enforce the kind of change necessary to address the climate change emergency. I think it's conceivable, and I think that the governments of the world who have been behaving best on climate recently are democratic ones. But there is a sort of um, thread of thinking, especially on the environmental left, that there may be some value in um, a more autocratic approach. Um, you know, at the sort of small scale level, that would mean you know the government taking control of industry and redirecting it. Mm. But also, um, conceivably, um, you know, the way that Xi Jinping is running um, the government in China, um, really by diktat, um, and it's possible that in order to truly avert um, catastrophic warming, we will need at least stronger armed government than we have now and possibly something a little bit even scarier to us. Okay, but there are plenty of strong armed scary governments around the world doing exactly the opposite. So what's the point of us, you know, being on best behavior, you know, avoiding meat and whatever it takes, while you've got, you know, the president of Brazil allowing the Amazon to be burnt down, or the Chinese, you know, opening one coal mine after another? That's a huge problem. Actually, for me, the geopolitical picture is the scariest part of this. I can imagine ways that governments like the US and the UK um, get to a really good place on emissions relatively soon. I see the politics moving in that direction. But there is this really perverse collective action problem at the geopolitical level where every individual nation, aside from China and the US and maybe India, contributes so little to the carbon emissions as a whole that they have very little incentive to take action themselves because even if they totally eliminate their emissions, they'll be living in the same climate regardless mm. unless the rest of the world um, is moving with them. So if we want to do something about it, if we want to reverse you know, the course of nature at the moment, describe to me how we will have to live you know, from now on. The IMF estimated this year that globally fossil fuels are being subsidized to the tune of $5.3 trillion annually. Now, to give a sense of what that means, um, it's conceivable that we could completely neutralize all of the world's carbon emissions 
um, that we're producing today, which means we can continue to operate exactly as we do today without adding any additional carbon to the atmosphere using a new kind of technology called carbon capture, which sucks carbon out of the atmosphere for a total of about $3 trillion a year. Now, there are many complications involved in that projection. It's really not reliable. We probably can't deploy carbon capture at that scale. Mm. But just as a suggestion of how much we're supporting a set of businesses that are destroying the planet, as opposed to redirecting those subsidies towards um, research and development into new technology that could allow us to live more prosperously here, I think it's a very illustrative contrast. If the governments of the world truly withdrew their support of the fossil fuel business, which depends on that largesse, for continuing to survive, and instead redirected that money and that political capital to a more livable way, um, way of life. I'm not sure that our consumer expectations um, in places like the US or the, or the UK would have to change all that much. If there's one image that you think is there that can sufficiently scare people into doing something or not being complacent, what is it? For me, it's been the California wildfires have been the most powerful teaching tool. I think the terror of imagining your own home being engulfed and in a perverse way, the fact that it was many homes of wealthy people, in fact, famous people, um, taught the world that this is not a threat that discriminates. Um, of course, people in the global south will be hit more intensely. Those countries are already suffering. But it's also an all-encompassing threat, which is coming for all of us and will change all of our lives in some way if we don't um, change course quickly. David Wallace-Wells, thank you very much. Thank you.